How did a beautiful two-year-old Hawaiian girl, a middle-aged golfer with leukemia, and a 16-year-old boy dying change this television reporter's life? We'll find out when we meet Comcast own Kevin Walsh right now on It's Your Call. As a reporter, we are often deluged with emotional stories, and if you don't learn to keep them at an arm's length, they can quickly overcome you, leaving you depressed or worse, cynical. But every once in a while, there's a heart-wrenching story that never leaves you, and in fact, even shapes you. It defines who you are. It's one of those stories that we share with you today. Hello everyone, it's good to have you with us. I'm Lynn Doyle. Now for me, it's the story of a 32-year-old wife and mother named Kelly who succumbed to breast cancer. That's one of the many that moves me to be such an advocate for breast cancer awareness. That she died just weeks after completing the three-day walk with me in Philadelphia still seems almost unbelievable to me. For my colleague, Kevin Walsh, it was a series of meetings while reporting in Hawaii that spawned an interest in and a devotion to bone marrow transplants and donations. It all started when he met this man, Chris Pablo, who was battling leukemia when by chance he reached into a bucket of golf balls and pulled out one that read, Beat Leukemia. Kevin did a feature piece on it and Chris's need for a marrow donor. That led to another story on this little girl who faced the same disease. As often happens, one story led to another, which led to huge public response and thousands of donors, including Kevin himself. Miraculously, Kevin's bone marrow ended up being a near-perfect match for a dying 16-year-old boy, and thus began a journey that he recounts for us in his first book, The Marrow in Me. We are delighted to have Kevin Walsh here in the studio with us to share some of that journey. Kevin, congratulations. Well, thanks so much. And it, it's just nice to be back sitting next to you and being on TV again. It feels like old times, doesn't it? It certainly does. A lot of people will remember that uh, Kevin has been on It's Your Call for a long time as a correspondent here with us. And we've done a lot of political coverage over the years together. So I'm delighted that uh, we have this opportunity to talk about this book because this isn't just a book for you. It truly does recount a journey that you, as a reporter, as an individual and as a devout Catholic embarked on. And you know what, Lynn, I, I think the thing for me is as much as we go searching and trying to find stories around us, the best ones always find us, don't they? It's not so much our doing, they just almost fall on our lap, we accept them for what they are, and then one thing leads to another, and hopefully if we're lucky enough and maybe we have some guidance along the way, we can put the pieces together, and, and that's what happened here. I didn't do anything special, I was just myself, and it just all fit together like a nice puzzle. And yet, when you look back on it, that saying, hindsight is twenty twenty, really does take a life of its own here, because when you look back on, on the different stories that led you to the different people and how they all seem to have a connection with each other, it seems like it, it was your destiny to report on this story. I can't think of it being any other way, and, it, and it's not that I discovered one day, like, hey, this led to this and this. It, it took some time and some reflection and discussions with some people, and I said, you know, I met this person, and then I met this person, and it all worked together, and then in the end, you just know that there's a story that's meant to be told, and, and then I just put the pencil to the paper, and, and the rest is history, all right, I guess. let's tell the story, because I know people are intrigued already. They want to know what journey uh, you have taken and, and how you have ended up helping uh, thousands, literally thousands of people. You were a reporter in Hawaii. He's a lifelong golfer. He's like one of those guys that could play golf 24-7 and very, very good at it. So you hear this, this idea for a feature on a man who was battling leukemia who had reached into a random bucket of golf balls when driving at the local course and it said beat leukemia on it. So you as a reporter say, wow, this could really make an interesting uh, human interest story. And, and the people that assigned me the story, I, I just showed up for work one day and the assignment editor says, you're going to cover the story of a guy who found a golf ball in his basket and it said, beat leukemia on it. And she's like, I, I don't know if that's any good. Is that any good? I'm like, is that any good? Well, as a golfer, I know what that means. That's almost like finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. So I got in touch with the man and I found out that he was, he was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia. And he went to the driving range one day just uh, because he was a golfer and he wanted to relieve some stress. And he got about halfway through the basket and all the balls were identical there, but there was one ball that was right in the middle of it all that he could tell by the dimple pattern on it. It was old, it was discolored, that it was different from the rest. 
the kind of ball that most golfers might just kind of pull out and kick aside because it wouldn't fly all that well. Well, for whatever reason, and he doesn't completely understand, he bent down, he plucked the ball out, and was just looking at it, and he turned it on its side and saw the words, beat leukemia, looking back at him. The fact that he was diagnosed with leukemia three weeks prior, and that ball ended up in his basket, instead of in the basket of the dozens of other golfers around him, I mean, I can't help but think that the ball found him and not the other way around. We're going to see that that uh, theme resonates throughout this interview and throughout the book where people and places and things kind of found each other and there was an end purpose in it. So you did the feature on Chris and actually became friends with him after a period of time. Yes, we, and we're good friends to this day. I saw him just recently and I just admired his courage. I admired his willingness and this is tough for guys sometimes because when we're going through suffering on, on any level, we usually don't like to wear our emotions on our sleeves. But he was just desperate enough and confident enough that he had a good enough story to tell and it might inspire some people to come out and register at bone marrow registration drives that he might find his match. So he made himself and his family open to us so I could see all the struggles that he had going on in his life. And in doing so, it just made for a great story on TV and later a great story to be told on the printed page. You felt it was important to educate the public at that time in Hawaii about this bone marrow donation. But you, until that time, really had no firsthand experience with it. No, I really didn't. But the story about the golf ball, because I'm a golfer, I knew that that was a once in a lifetime. That was a miracle find. So I thought I could tell other stories in such a way and, and wrap it around that one thing and share it with other people and then educate them about what bone marrow donation was all about. It can cure different cancers, namely cancers of the blood, leukemia. And in telling the story and putting it out there, and it wasn't just all me, there were other media, there were, there were newspaper writers, there were other television and radio reporters that were there. But an island public became educated to what this disease was and how we might be able to cure it. And as a result, it galvanized the community. 30,000 people showed up in an arena and gave, their bone marrow, or gave a sample of their blood to be tested for bone marrow typing. And ultimately, it led to a lot of matches. You know, I don't know if people understand <laughs> the, the depth of having 30,000 people come out as a result of something that you put out there on the public airways. I mean, that is absolutely remarkable by any stretch of the imagination. You, you must have felt an enormous amount of pride and, and just uh, like an un unbelievable uh, sense of accomplishment when you saw all of those people respond to what you had said. I think what happens is we want to tell these stories that really make a difference in people's life. Sure, we want something that's very interesting. It'll put a smile on people's faces or we'll make them think about it. But to actually spur them to take some time out of their day, to roll up their sleeve and get stuck with a needle to give a sample of blood, knowing that maybe if they're just lucky enough, they could get a call that eventually doctors might be drilling in their bones to take marrow out. But for the chance to save somebody's life, that's powerful stuff. And when you look back at it, all the stories you've done, I'm sure you know this in, in all the, the coverage you've done with breast cancer or awareness, when you know that talking about something and telling the story has led people to do something, it just makes you feel so good inside. It certainly does. Um, we know that you are interested in this topic, so if you have questions about bone marrow donations or transplants, if you'd like to get information about how you could become a donor, or if you have a similar story to Kevin's to share, we do want to hear from you. You know how it works. I invite you to email your thoughts and your opinions to me. If you have questions or comments for Kevin, we'll make sure that he gets them as well. You can log on to csnphilly.com, then put in It's Your Call or IYC under the search. That'll take you to my webpage where you can leave us that comment. Or if you'd like, you can email me directly here at the show. That's TCN, the Comcast Network, underscore IYC at ComcastNetwork.com. You can also find us on Facebook, MySpace, or YouTube. So we've talked about this uh, gentleman, uh, Chris Pablo, who, as Kevin said, turned out uh, to be in need of a bone marrow transplant, and he actually did find someone who matched him, correct? Incredible story. He, um, he found his match in a man named Roger Areola. Now Roger Areola was a double amputee who lost his legs in a Good Samaritan accident years earlier. That's Roger on the right side of your screen and that's Chris. And this is one of the first times that they had met. The backstory about Roger was years ago in Hawaii there was a car in a ditch and being the Good Samaritan that he was he pulled